Good morning, everyone. This is Joe Flick with the Montana State Library, and I am here with Zoanne Stoltz and Laura Treader from over at the Montana Historical Society, and they're going to give us a, a kind of overview and introduction to Montana's livestock brands and show you how you can find and research historic brands um, online this morning. So lots to learn. We're going to start this morning with a quick poll of our um, attendees. And we want you to tell us what you already know about this topic. So the question is on your screen, what do you already know about Montana's livestock brands online? So quick, if you could select your choice. We're looking for um, a good percentage of our, present, of our attendees this morning. Looks like we've got about half the folks have responded. So if you can take a moment and just click on there. We'll give you a few more seconds. Okay, let's see what we've got. I'll show mm -hmm. the results. So you should now see on your screen that about 12% of our attendees this morning don't know a thing about livestock brands. So they're, um, that represents actually two people. And then they know they exist, but that's about it. That's my category. Um, that's 24%. And then most of the people feel Fill, fall right in the middle. They've looked at them once or twice. Um, and then only a few say they've actually found useful information to share with patrons or know all about the resource. So there you go. Thank you very much for participating in our poll. And I'm going to turn things right over to you, Zoanne, to get started. Take it away. Hey. This meeting is being recorded. Can I get rid of that? There we go. Oh my gosh, I can't thank everybody enough for joining us this morning. I um, This is an exciting topic for me. I think it's fascinating as a historian that these records are a Montana treasure. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to introduce to you the evolution and the creation of the brand records, as well as talk about how they've become more than just marks of ownership. They've become symbols and they've become history in Montana. Then Laura will take over. She's got the hard part and she's going to explain, <laughs> she's going to explain the, com the complexity, no, the wonder that is these old brands. And Bear in mind that we can, because of the system created in 1872, we can start in 2011 and go back in time to find a brand. It takes a little bit of time, but I just can't give enough credit to our ancestors and for their, their wonderful brains, I guess. All right. So. Oops, excuse me. So brand, livestock brands, in case you haven't noticed, they are everywhere in Montana. All you have to do is see cattle on the side of the road to know that you're going, you're passing brands. But aside from being on saddles, on, on quilts, on belts, they're also right along the highway. And this, this particular highway sign is actually posted in two places in Montana. One is just a little bit east of Malta and the other way, other brand or other, excuse me, sign is between Forsyth and Miles City. So brands are not just for cattle. Then a brief history. Ancient peoples branded, and when I say brand, I mean marked with a scar, uh, their property, Egyptian tombs have shown evidence of livestock being branded. The Japanese have a system called mons that they put on clothing that will identify them to a certain group. And then when it comes to Montana, this sounds crazy, but we have evolved from a system created by the Connecticut Dutch in 1644, specifically a law adopted in Connecticut that enacted first colonial brand law, 
1644 required to brand your cattle and swine when they are a year and a half old and then register the mark in a town book. Amazing, 1644 from Connecticut. But we also share some traditions that have come up from the Spanish up through Mexico and up north, from the south to the north. The Spanish brands are a little bit different in that they were more, um, I'm gonna say a trademark. Once you had that mark, it was yours and it could be used on just about everything is my understanding. And then of course, it's just a wonderful part of our history and American as well as Montana ranching. So what is so important about these brands? They just start out initially as a way to establish ownership. Uh, if you've got a small cornfield and there are cows in it and you don't know whose cows they are, you can identify the brand, call the brand office, and they'll tell you whose cows are in the cornfield. Or you can also, believe it or not, rustling is alive and well in the state, and it is a way to deter rustling. So initially, it establishes ownership, and then it begins to, <clears throat> through the years, represent the owners and their families. And it becomes very personal to many, many people. Then the next step is they become associated with specific people, places, and stories. They evoke a certain sense of history. They evoke a specific story, quite honestly. Yeah. Now, before we get going full bore, everybody wants to know the first. And I wish I could give you a simple answer, but it's just like who's on second and what's on third? What do you mean by the first? So, as far as I know, as far as my research goes, and I'm always more than happy to see evidence that I'm wrong. The first that I know of was the branding by Lewis and Clark, October 5th, 1805 with the Nez Perce. And Lewis and Clark was about to go over the mountains into the Columbia River Basin and out to the Pacific. They were leaving their, many of their horses with the Nez Perce they wanted to mark them so when they returned, they would be able to identify them right away. First used in what is to become Montana for agriculture was at St. Mary's in the 1840s, the Schmidt and the Jesuits used cross on a hill for their sheep and cattle. Now the first legislative authorization was a trademark, number 84, approved for a gentleman called Tom Pitt and he was uh, one of the popular members of the vigilantes, and he was known as 84. He had a, a ditty that he used to sing that had the number 84. And then the first registered brand in the current system is the Square and Compass, created and recorded by Poindexter and Orr out of the beaver head. So, quick look at the laws and the evolution, and you will not be tested for this. So 1864, when Montana Territory is established, the, the law reads that people are to sign up or record their brand at the county seat. Well, if you've ever seen a map of Montana in 1864, you know that the counties are huge. It's mostly open range. And in some counties, it's a long ways to go. So with all those issues, there were just too many conflicts and too many issues in 1864. So in 71 and 72, the Legislative Assembly created a general office for recording brands and marks to be kept in a suitable book for the purpose which shall be free to the inspection of all persons interested. And that's where these amazing records do come in. They are mandated at the, the Office of Brand Records to open their books to everybody. But I want you to notice just what that means. We've got a vault on the left with leather brown books, leather bound books. And on the right, we have printouts for several decades. So things start getting a little complicated and it takes time to do a brand search. And quite honestly, the brand office folks don't have time to help with, with a search. 
as it turns out, the Historical Society Research Center is, is more than prepared to help folks. So in 1877, the brand office was mandated to be at the center of government. 1885 is known as the Cowboys legislature because so much legislation was passed to protect the open range, which was soon to uh, meet its demise. 1911, we're coming in, we have come into the homestead era. Everybody coming to Montana wants a brand, but the brand office does no, no longer knows which brands are viable. So there's a re-record. In 1921, there is another re-record, and that is the first re-record I call the regular re-record. And yes, 2021 will be the next re-record. And then another date to remember about these brand records is that in 2002, Ivan Doig and his wife donated the money to get them on microfilm and make it easier for folks to search for their brands. So the significance to Montana and history as a whole, quite honestly, whether you're talking about the Dakotas or Wyoming, <clears throat> genealogy. We see at the research center people who have never been to Montana, but find that they have relatives who homesteaded or own property here, and they want to know if their their um, ancestor had a brand. Then our Varre covered is part of our culture. You can go anywhere, and it will be on on bar walls. Not that I hang out in bars, but just enough to know that the brands are on bar walls. They're on our barns. There, if we go to the county fair, they're an integral part of it. They're vital to Montana's story. And interestingly enough, they show our historical trends and stories. Many people don't realize that the original cattle from going, coming into Montana ter territory came from the western part of the United States. So the ranches were the western ranches were established first, and then we start in the era of the cattle drives coming from the Souths, and those eastern ranches are established. Homesteading era is crazy, and when you look at those those registration books, you can tell that there must have been a little bit of mayhem in the in the office as they tried to contend with all of the incoming requests. And then we see our modern trends, and then inevitably many of them, if not all of them, eventually come down to personalities and stories and history. And here we have the first and I want you to notice that the brands are hand drawn, but also look at how many of, I call these paragraphs, but how many of the records have handwriting through them. And if you're familiar with OCR, this negates any possibility of getting successful um, searches out of the OCR process. So the first brand was Poindexter and Orr's Square and Compass. Yes, they were Masons. I do not believe they were involved in any conspiracies. They had a partnership back in the West in California um, for meat markets and cattle. In 63, they brought cattle to Idaho City. 1865, Orr brings cattle to Bannock. And at that time, he realizes how much grassland is available in Montana. The next year, Poindexter and Orr bring all of their cattle sh and sheep from the west and they establish the, what is now the Matador Ranch outside of Dillon. Another one you may recognize or not even know that it's there is this amazing sketch by Charlie Russell. And this is the Bar R and it belonged to Stadler and Kaufman who had meat markets in Helena through, throughout some mining or locations. But the Bar R in the winter of 86, 87, as it happens, they had a lot of their cattle in the Judith Basin. I don't know how many of you have driven through the Judith Basin when the wind is blowing this time of year, but it's not someplace you wanna be out in the open. And <clears throat> during that time, Kaufman wrote to their foreman, a Mr. Phelps, asking for a report on the herds. As luck would have it, Mr. Phelps entertained Charlie Russell, a young ranch hand, quite often. And when he was bemoaning the fact that he did not know how to begin to let Stadler and Kaufman know about the state of their herds, Russell said, according to, to legend, how 
how about if I paint you a picture? And here is a straggler from the bar R, um, surrounded by wolves. And this picture does tell, is a thousand words. Another legendary brand is the Two Dot. And Two Dot Wilson and his wife came to the territory, again, initially in the territory. They made money in the gold fields and being, I think, tired of the gold fields and realizing that there was a better way to make money, they brought cattle up from Salt Lake City. Initially, the cattle were kept um, in Jefferson outside of Bold Boulder. And you notice the two dot, his original two dot is vertical. And then some years later, he has horizontal two dots. And by that time, he's moved to Mark County and what many would call also the Judith Basin. Interestingly about the Wilsons is they worked as a, as a, a partnership when there was cattle drives. Mrs. Wilson was often the cook and she accompanied her husband quite frequently on cattle drives. At one time, a little town two dot outside of Harlowton had uh, the railroad had a hardware store, had a, had a bank. Currently, as far as I know, the only business viable right now on Main Street is the Two Dot Bar, and I understand they're happy to see anybody come down that road. And as I became more familiar with the brands and more curious, shall we say, I believe that sometimes brands symbolized hopes of, or signs of hope as well as success. And certainly that is evident, I think, in the Joseph and Elizabeth Proctor's Lazy M. K. Bar. Now Joseph, as a young teenager, was a freed, freedman after the Civil War. He went west and decided he was gonna be a cowboy. And he participated in a lot of drives from the south into what is, Wyoming, the Dakotas, and Montana. In 1901, he had the sense to marry an amazing woman by the name of Elizabeth McHugh in Forsyth. And by that time, they, they had a ranch 45 miles out of Forsyth. In 1940 and 31, they decided that they wanted to live closer to civilization. And they sold that ranch and bought another place that was just outside of Forsyth. They had two daughters pictured there. And as you can see, the daughters continued the ranching tradition with that bar MP standing for Martha Proctor. Amazing folks. And then I want to introduce the Carenza family to you. The Carenzas, Anstacio, Anstacio, Ranza brought his family into the States during the Mexican Revolution because it was not a, a safe place for so many families. Initially, the family followed the railroad and work. And then in the 20s, the Holly Sugar Company, as may have, many of you, especially on the East Side, may be aware, the Holly Sugar Company put out advertisements for Mexican families to help with and to become established and help with the sugar beet harvesting. The Carranza family answered this call. They settled around Sydney, Montana, and by 1925, they've purchased their own ranch. And one of the things that I find interesting in their obituaries is that both with um, the original Carranzas as well as Martha, who is there in black and, and blue in the left-hand corner, their obituaries really emphasize the fact that the Kranzes worked year long, as did the kids, but somehow the kids managed to attend school. I don't know how to do that when I've got a daughter who's having a hard time being at home with her kids um, from school. So kudos to the Kranza family. If you think this picture, the photo in the middle of Juanita is familiar, then that means that you get the WR. WARP magazine, they had a photo essay on her. And she continues to run, to maintain that family heritage. The family has become community members and community leaders. And how amazing 
what a legacy that Anstancio and his wife left with these amazing ranches and, and children. And then just a quick overview of other brands. So we've got the top Eve brand, Blonde to Evelyn and Ewan Cameron. They were settled outside of Sydney. Then we've got the Oak, the Yoke brand, Blonde to Nelson Story, the XIT, 10 in Texas. If you're from the east side, you might be more prone to, to have that sound familiar. The XIT was one of the larger firms who brought cattle up from Texas to have them fattened up in Montana and then sent by rail to the east. And then we've got the Elkhorn, and it just fascinates me that Teddy Roosevelt left Montana and the Dakotas, but maintained his Elkhorn brand. And if you look at that record, his address is Oyster Bay, New York. Amazing. Now, one of my favorite stories is this tuning fork. And Ida was originally Ida Pound. She came to the territory with her mother on steamboat to join her father and brothers who had established a place on the mussel shell. She traveled with her grand piano. Initially, the uh, captain of the steamboat refused to, well, insisted that the grand piano stay on deck, I guess so he could keep an eye on it, I'm not sure. But rumor has it, or legend has it, that Ida entertained the people on the steamboat every evening by playing her piano, as she did the folks who came and picked up her mom and her from Fort Benton on the trip home. They brought enough horses and enough wagons to get her grand piano onto to their ranch. She later marries a Mr. Busha, who lives in Big Timber. He's a businessman. She's a school teacher and a music teacher, but interestingly enough, her, that brand, the Tuning Fork brand, stays in Ida's name the whole, her whole lifetime. And I'm very glad to say both the Grand Piano as well as the Tuning Fork brand are still in the family. A lot of women had their own brands. And then we come to one of my favorite L.A. Huffman photos is um, the Nighthawk. He has been writing the herd all night, and this may very well be all of his worldly possessions, and he's tired. But this is just a segue to remind you that Laura is gonna be talking about access to original records, primary documents. And so they've got their idiosyncrasies, and they take a little time. This is not Google. And Laura, I'm gonna let you take it away. Okay, unmute, uh, share my screen here. And get going. Okay, press my timer. Well, I'm gonna stop my timer. I'm gonna try and um, keep us on track here. I, the timing should be just right. We're not gonna have a lot of time for questions, but I'm gonna try and leave you to minutes for questions here at the end. Um, okay, so thanks Zoanne for sharing those awesome stories, the, the history of our recordings as well as those stories behind a lot of our registrations. As Zoanne said, I'm going to talk about the online records. Um, I'm going to prepare you to work with your patrons um, so they can get their own, uh, get into their own brand research. Um, I'm going to share what these records are and what they're not and talk about um, how to get started, look at some, a couple of handouts, a couple of resources we've um, prepared for you, and then look at how the online records are organized. We're gonna pick apart some listings and then touch on some search strategies, all in 25 minutes. So um, this slide should look familiar to you, of course, because I, I stole it from Zoanne. What I changed on this slide are the years across the top to list the first decade, um, the first year of each decade that we have online. Note that 1873 does go through 1910, so there's not a gap there. 1911 starts that re-record pattern for every 10 years, and there is a gap in the online records for 1981 and 1991. We're working on them, but um, we don't really, at this point, have an estimate of when we're going to get them added. Um, they are a priority, but if, 
things have kind of changed this year. Let's just leave it at that. And we have arranged to get the 2011 through 2020 records at the end of this month. Um, and we do hope to get those online in 2021, but again, no promises. Uh, so these online records are an unmodified based online scan, basically, of these physical volumes that we see in the slide. So I wanted to put the slide back up again. Um, when you're using these online records, you're not searching some cleaned up version or database of these records. You are not searching a hand transcription of these records. As Zoanne said, we run OCR software on these um, images to translate the text um, to something that a computer can make sense of, but it's far from perfect process with these records. Um, just looking at the pages, as Zoanne pointed out, some of the things that you can see that would make um, getting a clean OCR conversion pretty difficult, um, but that's okay, because again, we keep telling you, the brand office created an amazing system that has enabled the public, the brand office themselves, and the public to track these registrations through time. So what we're doing today, learning the history of the recording and understanding the organization of these records is really gonna pay off for you. So, getting started. Um, before you dive into these records, you do your patrons will need to prepare a little bit and you can help them with this. Uh, so first off is gather your information. So patrons would be really helpful to list, actually list out what they know. What names do you have? What are some common variations of those names? Would the brand have been registered their grandfather's name or their grandmother's name, like Zoanne was showing us? Um, what's their grandmother's maiden name? Kind of get all of that information together. Um, could the brand have been registered in a company name as well? And then what town or county would they have likely registered in? Remembering that those county boundaries changed over time since those early registrations. Um, what year range would they have likely registered the brand? The earliest, the latest. Searches do not need to start at the beginning or the end, but it's useful to have a sense of that range. Um, and then of course, what does the brand look like? And here's where we like to insert that, remember, grandma was often wrong. <laughs> I always feel a little bad saying that, but what we mean is just that some of the details might be off, right? I think we can all relate to our memories not being so great, like, you know, pre-March. Some of those details are already fuzzy for me. So just remember that what she shared with us or what we remember her sharing with us is going to be our starting point for our research and not our ending point. We want to use those stories and details to help our search but don't let those details limit your search. Ultimately, your patron does need to have a name or a brand configuration though to get into these records. The years and geographic locations are gonna help narrow and confirm your listings. So next we got gather your resources. Um, of course, to use the online records, you're, you'll need a, your patron will need a computer and an internet connection which you have at your library. Um, and we put together a couple of handouts. One is a searching guide for the online records and the second is a guide to help you pick apart these individual listings. Uh, I will, I'll show you where these are on our website because those are gonna be, always have the most updated version of the, um, of the handouts. I just updated them yesterday, so that's the best place to go. And then the third point is gather yourself. And because remember what Zoanne, how she ended it is brands equal work. So patrons can do this, but they need to clear some time. Um, when a researcher comes in the reference room, I'll ask them right away how much time they have to get going. And if they say they have 10 minutes, um, I'll show them where the handouts are and how to get to the collection. Um, but that's about it. And if they have more time, I'll, I can sit down and get going with them. I recommend as people get started, this for the first time, really get an hour. That's not, that's not unreasonable. Um, folks who want to go home and do this, I kind of, I jokingly, not jokingly say, you know, get a cup of tea, get some slippers and get cozy and, and have some fun, but definitely clear some time. So then this is for you. That's kind of what I tell our patrons, but you as librarians, how can you get started? Um, and basically it's how we just do what we always do. We just kind of take a deep breath and 
tap into our powers. Um, but you definitely can get those resources. So grab those handouts for sure right away. And remember that you're not alone. We are a resource for you and your patrons. So please feel free to call, email, and refer. So let's see. Um, so going to the handouts. I'm using screenshots just because I, I didn't want to risk slowness or me making typos and distracting this. So bear with me on that. Um, to get to the handouts, you're going to go to our website, the Historical Society website, mhs.mt.gov. You, of course, can just Google that. Um, across the top of the pages on our site is this banner here with the different tabs for the different programs within the society, and we're the research center. So hover over that, select online collections and finding needs, and you'll get taken to this page. Off to the site here is the Montana History Compass, and that's where the handouts are. Um, you can, of course, just Google Montana History Compass as well and go there, but I always like to show people our website. So there's great additional information there. Once you get to the Montana History Compass, this is, oh, I'm moving this, um, this is what you'll see here. Click on Subject Guides, click on Livestock Brands and Montana Guide, and then this is the page you'll get to. This is some good general information, some of what Zoanne reviewed. And if you scroll down, you will see the two links to the two handouts. This is the first one, the Searching Online Brands handout. Um, this is guide gets you to the online records and gives you some searching information that's specific to these um, online records. The next handout brands by the decade. And this is one that even when you get comfortable navigating the online with the mechanics and navigating those online records, this is something you're just going to pull out every time. There's a lot of details in, um, in each listing that there's no reason you should try and memorize. Um, and we will come back to this handout. So here we are at the memory project. Many of you are familiar, I think, with the online memory project, the MMP. This is where our records, the online records, live. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Memory Project, it's a free online source for digital collections relating to Montana heritage from institutions from across the state. Um, it's administered by the State Library in partnership with us. Um, Jennifer Brunell, who I did see made it today after all, as an MMP director. Um, she's created really, really good tutorials and other um, support for using this website. So please use that. We're just going to look at stuff that we have for our specific collection, but there's a lot of other good information on using any collections on the Memory Project available to you. So we're gonna, just going to go straight to the um, livestock collections. So I, how I get there and how I tell patrons is click on collections right there. You get taken to a collection page. It lists everything, all the 180 plus collections, but I'll, I always go ahead and you go to the search box here, type in brands, livestock, something like that. And then the collections will limit down to this to ours. So and then you click on the title here on this box and you get taken to the summary page. Um, that's a little information about our records, but for today we're just gonna click the browse button and here we are. Um, so it, it's worth taking a minute here to, to kind of talk about, like I said, the organization, how these are um, organized online here. So you'll see I've highlighted in green, there's 30, 30 online records right now. Um, and you can actually think about these records as 30 volumes. That's a really easy way to kind of to work, work with them and think about them. Um, you can start to see that the records or the volumes are sorted by year in chronological order, earliest year range, 1873 through 1910. And then that re-record cycle sets up, starts beginning for 1911 through 20, and it continues on. Um, the next thing you'll notice is that within the year ranges, there's multiple volumes. Um, looking what's on screen here, you see that 1873 through 1910 has three volumes, one brand indexed by brands, brand index by name, and then uh, brand registration volume. Not all decades have index volumes, sadly, and some decades have multiple volumes of registrations. And you don't need to memorize that, but just kind of take a moment and see what's available for uh, the decade you're working with. 
So let's talk about the two index volumes um, for a moment. Um, from First off, I'll just say from 1873 through 1941, there are two index volumes available. After that, there are no index volumes available. That's okay, but <laughs> something to keep in mind. So the brand abetical index is an index of brand configurations. Um, it's organized into sections by shape, letter, and number. So if the first character in your brand configuration is the letter A, you would look in the letter section and then go to that A grouping. Um, if your first character in your configuration is a heart, then you go to that shape section in this um, index and go to where all the hearts are grouped together. Um, when you look at a page here, you see what you see, you have these hand-drawn sketches with all these page numbers for that specific configuration. But understand that each page number next to a configuration is going to be for different registrations. Um, so look at, again, look, look at this diamond here and all, all of these page numbers here. That's not for one string of recordings and transfers and all of that of the same brand. And that's because a brand is more than just the configuration. The configuration is the easiest way to talk about it and to group it in an index. But when you register your brand, you register the configuration along with the animal, location on the animal, and geographic location in the state, or even out of state, as we saw. Um, so one configuration can be registered to different people at the same time that those elements differ. This index works great, but you do need to know the configuration to get into it, and it's not computer searchable. It's okay. And then next, the name index volume. So um, as you see on the slide, the two earliest sets of index name index volumes are handwritten, meaning they can be really difficult um, to read and they're, they're not computer searchable because we have not um, hand transcribed them. Um, they are collated by the first letter and then the first vowel of the last name. The names are ordered grouped pretty well, but um, sometimes they're not perfect. Uh, so for example, like a final page designated for a specific letter vowel combination can fill up. And then there's some additional names that need to be added and they kind of get tucked in on different places, usually within that same first letter section. Um, sometimes there's a note directing you to the page number of that overflow, but not always. So they're really valuable, but you can already get a sense they can be pretty time consuming to use. Um, and then 21, 31, and 41, the name index volumes are typed, which is great. It means you can get much better computer search results and you can browse and read the names um, a lot more easily. Um, Zoe always recommends to start any brand search in a decade with a type name index if possible, um, because ultimately your first task here is to locate one listing. Once you get your listing, you can move forward or backwards in the records. Um, and to confirm again, starting 1951, moving forward, there are no index volumes available. And then there's also, of course, the registration volumes. And this is where you find your actual listings. Um, this is a clip on the slide. There's clips of registrations from different decades. Looking more closely, you see that each registration includes bits of information. A typical listing includes the configuration, of course, a registration date, registration certificate number, the name of the person or businesses registering that brand, person's town or county, not always, sometimes, um, a residence, uh, later county range gets added, um, the type of animal for which it's registered and the placement on that animal. It's all in there. Um, and they have added information, as Zoan pointed out as well, such as re-record dates, transfer dates, names, page, or certificates, numbers. So and that's the, that handwritten or stamped information. Um, it's a lot of information, but don't worry, because we have that by the decade handout that we looked at briefly, and we're going to look at again to help you make sense of all of this. Okay. Um, so before we initiate a search, I just want to confirm that you do need to be on the collection page because in the memory project, um, different search boxes will uh, actually search different content. So if you're on that main 
if you're on the home page for the memory project and you use that main search box, you're collect you're searching the entire content of all of all collections within the memory project. And if you um, use the search box on a collection page, you're just going to search content within that collection. So we definitely want to do that for this, these records. So <clears throat> here, to search across all volumes, all 30 of these volumes in the brand collection, I use this right here. I typed in the term stults because apparently the treaders aren't from around here. <laughs> so, um, now what we can see here, this is the result page. Uh, we now have 20 volumes, records, results or volumes that include our search term at least once. Some of them have it in there multiple times. Um, from here, what you're gonna do is look at your list, select the volume you wanna look at, um, knowing that your result lists are gonna include index volumes, registration volumes, different years. And this is where it is nice to have a sense of year range that you're looking for. Um, so I've looked at my list and determined I want to look in the 1941 through 51 registration volume. So I click on the title and here I get taken to the first page in this specific volume that includes my search term. So what I want to point out though here, a couple of some different sections on this page. Um, I've kind of separated out in green here. So across the top, this right here, I've, I've boxed in red, shows you which volume you're in. Like I said, the 1941 through 50 brand registration volume and the page number. And this, I, I like to just point this out because when you're using these records, you're gonna move back and forth and all around through all these volumes. And this is a really quick way to just like remind yourself, what volume, what year am I looking at? What am I doing? Um, and then the main section of this page here is the scanned, is the scanned page from the registration volume. I put in red here are Mr. Harold Stoltz. And then over here is um, the page sorter. And what you see here, there were nine, nine results. So nine times that the term word Stoltz is in this one volume. You also see you're on page C551. It's highlighted and no, I did not put this little red line in here. This is from the software. This is how it shows you which pages include your term. And I wanna take a second though to look a little more closely at this page sorter because using these um, volumes, you're, you're, you're gonna to need to become comfortable with this. So here I have three different views of the page sorter on the slide. These are all from the 1931 through 1940 registration volume. The first clip is what you see if you didn't enter a search term at all and you just went to that, you know, out of the first 30 volumes, you just went to this registration volume and clicked on it to open it up. Um, you'll see that this registration volumes, and some do, not all do, um, separate your listings into different sections, so re-records and then new transfer brands. If you were in a brand medical index, like I said, there'd be a section for symbols, a section for letters, a section for numbers. Um, so to browse to a page in the re-record section, you click on that plus sign and that takes you here to the second clip. Notice now, of course, that that, um, that plus sign is now a minus sign. If you want to collapse that, you can just click the minus sign again and it'll collapse that all back down. Um, this isn't really new for many of us. Um, but we know we want to go to page B251, so that's good. I'm going to, in the same way, click this plus sign here to expand this page section. It takes us over here. Here's B251. And um, notice, though, that this the panel here for this page sorter, it doesn't get any larger throughout, when you, even as you expand pages and sections. So it can get a little disorienting. You're gonna use the um, arrows in the scroll bar to move up and down um, that list. Um, it's, I said, it, it's not complicated, but it can get disorienting. And sometimes I will collapse, <clears throat> collapse sections just to make it a little bit easier for myself. Hey, Laura, this is Joe. I'm just gonna jump in here um, because you, you started by talking about how important it was to just go to the brand's collection in the Montana Memory Project when you're starting your search. And there was a question about that, um, you know, whether if you could just reiterate um, the difference between searching on the Mon MMP's homepage, the Montana Memory Project's homepage versus searching within 
an individual collection and how that works? Um, so the, the main search box on the Memory Project homepage, this one here, if you just typed in a person's name trying to get a brand out of this, it, it probably will show up in your results, but you're searching all of the collections from all the contributors um, in the memory project. You're not searching just specifically in the brand collection. And since what we're doing is so targeted, if you will, um, that's this clip doesn't have it, of course not. Uh, you want to use this search box here in the in the brand in the brand run to do search just the brand collection hopefully that helps so that makes and we are like i said this you're not going to learn everything today so please contact us reach out to us and we love to help you we'll talk on the phone with you and, and guide you through a lot of this it, it is a lot of information on cramming in here i know this we both zoe and i both know this last time we did this it was a two-hour session so we're really flying. <laughs> um, hold, hold on, we're hold on fast. We've still got a ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So going back to our Mr. Harold Stoltz search, right? We, we we searched for him. I looked into the 1941 through 1950 registration volume because that's where I I knew he had recorded. And this is that a clip of that box I highlighted, Harold Stoltz. Okay. Um, yes, this is the brand we know that we're looking for. Um, and this is where we're going to pull out the by the decade handout that we put together for you. Because you're going to look at this and you're going to know, oh, I'm sure this is telling you something really important, but I don't know what. So you pull out the by the decade handout. Each decade has its own page because they're all kind of same, same, but different. And I'm just going to go ahead and look at this B-251, might be sounding familiar. Um, look over here, where is something that looks like that? This B- here, so that's number four. Look down here, so this is, right there, is a page number for the previous brand recording. In this example, the leading B directs you to the re-record section in the 1931 through 1940 registration volume. Okay. So what you're going to do then is go back to your list um, of the all the records of the volumes in this online collection. You're going to find that 1931 through 1940 registration volume. You're going to use the page sorter, all right, that we just looked at, and you're going to go to the re-record section. You're going to expand that and expand, expand to get to page B251 in this 1931 volume and here we are sure enough on page we're now in this volume we see the page number page number page number over here and here is our Harold Stoltz he recorded it January 2nd 1931 so now we've got two pieces of, of this history right here we got 31 and then we got when he re-recorded it in 41 and we have more information right here so we're going to pull out that by the decade handout and see what where this number right here is going to lead us so, see, it's just really easy, right? <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes it does just like two, two, two falls right in place like a perfect jigsaw puzzle, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, so just kind of real quickly, I'll talk about what you do when it just doesn't work that quite that neatly. Um, these are some scenarios where that happen all the time. You have a name, you use a search box, but your search results, include your brand, but there's a gap, right? And so it's not a complete history. Or your search results are, you get some good search results, but it doesn't have your brand in there. You go and look in all those volumes, and you don't find your brand. Or you get zero search results. So what do you do? Um, in the first one, I, you're gonna pull out that Buy That Decade handout and go to one listing that is in your results there and then just start following that brand forward and backward like we just did. And this happens all the time. And honestly, um, when I first, when I get my first listing, I tend to just stick with that one and not even, I kind of forget about searching even. I just start browsing um, using that page sorter and that handout. In the second scenario, uh, your search results are got a bunch of them there, but they don't include uh, your listing. 
So again, this, this, this happens a lot. Um, Cause remember the OCR problem, right? That that's the root of this. this is kind of why we keep talking about that. Um, you can just go open up the name index volume, right? And just go and find them there. Especially, hopefully, it's a typed index. You can get through it pretty quickly. Um, if you know the brand configuration, you can use the brand medical index. It works, can work really well. Um, this zero search results, kind of the same thing. Um, you can use the index volumes. This is where you can try searching variations of the name. That's kind of why you're thinking about how other ways it could have been recorded. Try some different searches. But in reality, too, this only gets you so far. Those solutions only get you so far. So, because what if you have search results, they don't include your brand, but your registration doesn't start until the 70s? There's no index volume for you to go to. You've tried a little bit of um, creative searching, you're stuck. So, this is, this is the kind of where you need to get to work, right? So, here's an example. It's pretty quick Olive dog taking gun. We know, we know a lot of information about this. We know the brand configuration. We know it was recorded in the 70s. And she lived in Hart Butte. So I'm going to go ahead and, and do a search. I will use the search box on that collection page for the livestock brands. I'm a little nervous because I know there's no index volumes to fall back on. But you're, you're just going to, that's what you're going to do. You're going to start with a search. And I did that. You can see here's my search term here. It's just to the dog taking gun. And we've got a couple of hits for 1931 from the index and the registrations. And okay, well, we know she didn't record to the 70s, but let's go ahead and take a quick look. It's worth it. Um, so here it is. I opened up that volume. Um, I found this here. It's not in the exact same configuration, but it's pretty close. Um, and it's the same family name, same part of the state, Browning, close to Hart Butte. Okay, um, I see that it wasn't re-reported. I know this because this is a stamp that says notice sent and this is a stamp that says notice unclaimed. Um, but I'm gonna still just go ahead and follow it because it's, it's, it's possible that um, they let it expire, they go inactive, and then they re-recorded it. So I pull out my by the decade handout for, um, what year am I in? <laughs> 31 through 40. And um, look, find out what this information is right here, right here, because I can see this is something. This is kind of hard to read, but I'm going to go with this because I'm wanting to move it forward. That's what I know. So I see this is uh, some recording happened in 1947. I can assume that's a, a date. And so here, this looks really similar. So it's number five, handwritten date page number to whom the brand was transferred okay and so we're gonna go to the next year so we're gonna go to 41 through 50 registration volume get to that page number I won't walk you through it but sure enough I get there the brand is that configuration is there but it is to a different family name in uh, Big Timber and so I determined that's not gonna lead me anywhere that's not all that's not gonna take me back to Olive um, and in, I want to just kind of quickly acknowledge that that is some ways not very surprising given um, some history that we have here that happened in that 30s, which is a topic for someone else to talk about than me. Um, but, but back to this, because we remembered, we're thinking about those name variations, we're getting creative. Um, we know sometimes that dog taking gun is spelled out as written as one word, not three words. So I'll do that search, type that in as one word. And I did, and I still got no results. Another thought is books. You can, you can, you don't have to stick with only the online records when you're trying to put together history. There are some great state and regional um, brand books out there in our collections. I'm sure in your collections too, by stock growers associations and other, other groups. We have the two volume work Brands Across Montana that was published in 1984. So it's telling you um, brands that were registered in the 80s, early 80s, which we still think she's in the 70s, but it's close enough that it's worth looking. And she wasn't in there either. <laughs> 
And so this is now, remember that reference I made to kind of getting cozy, like you just kind of relax and get cozy. Um, this is, this turn is turned into one of those times. So the next thing that I would do, and keep this in mind, this is how I would go about the search. There are certainly other ways to do this. And other people in the research center could approach this differently and come out with great results as well. So what I would do at this point is I go straight into the 71 through 80 volume. I'm not looking at across all volumes anymore. I kind of got what I could out of that. And I'm gonna do a search for olive, right? It was like, I'm, I'm reaching here, but you know, how many olives are there gonna be in there? It turns out there's 126 olives in this book, um, this one volume, which actually isn't not a scary number. <laughs> there's some uh, in the, with some of the, um, a documentation that Jennifer's put out there and, or we can help you with, there's some ways to pretty efficiently move through a, a 126 results. And in our case, we can kind of guess, take an educated guess that we're just gonna look in the new transfer brand section and not the re-report section. So we're moving through those results already. Um, but remember, we believe she recorded her brand when she was living in Heart Butte. So when I add Heart Butte to Olive, searching within this one registration volume, um, I'm down to 10 results. It's like, whoa, that is amazing. And it turns out, just scrolling through those 10 results, she's the second one. So there she is. Um, so I wanna <laughs> caution you on the search because remember what we said about grandma being wrong and to get too caught up in Olive and Heart Butte and she doesn't show up. So then you think, well, they must have been wrong. But you know, she could have been, had a PO box and Browning or, you know, we don't know for sure. So if you have that many details from a patron, there it's probably something happened. So just kind of be persistent and you just kind of had to just at some point maybe scroll through 126 results. It's okay. Um, and one last tip why I put this on here, this the transcription down here is um, when, when you know, when searches fail, those uh, keyword searches fail, and I'm kind of really pushing through to, to find it, to find the listing. When I do find it, I will often take a look at the OCR transcription just to kind of see, well, what happened, what went wrong, as well as get some um, ideas on how how the OCR software read, read it, just to like, because I have had searches where they'll just be like a, uh, odd space will get put in there. And so if, perhaps if you had searched um, taking gun, it might have come up. In this case, it wouldn't. But um, that gives you some, sometimes can give you an insight into some really tricky searching. Two quick questions for you, Laura. One is um, several of the records you showed reference a vent on the record. And when somebody asked what that means when it's uh, talking about below cattle and horses and position for the brand. What is the vent? Vent, uh, Zoe Ann, you can tell for sure. It's when you when you um, sell the cattle. Is that right? Sell the livestock? And if the cattle, if, if the, yes, if um, you sell a herd and you've got the um, semicircle ZX, then um, you want to show that that's no longer viable. And so a vent is essentially just a slash and it doesn't necessarily have to be through the brand. It will be sometimes under it or over it, whatever the um, designation is. Okay. But a way of controlling the, f the legal flow of animals. Mm -hmm. Good question, good answer. And the other question was about, OCR, so if you do find an error in the OCR transcription, um, is there a way that that can be corrected in, in the Montana Memory Project? Is there um, at, at this point, there's not a way for you as a user community member to enhance the OCR. And at this point, we at the historical study aren't taking that on either. I mean, just look at this one little clip, right? Um, we, we did, improve the OCR transcription conversion for the 61 through 70 volumes this summer. I don't know when, see, I don't know when. I think it was, maybe it was last summer. <laughs> and that was a huge improvement. So we, we tweak them and we try and improve it, but it's a pretty big task. We've talked about, especially with even the name indexes, you know, having a community project to transcribe those, but it's, it would be, it's just one more thing. And, um, but we haven't been able to take on yet. 
Yeah, you're going to see a lot of mistakes. <laughs> um, I know we're at 10 o'clock. I want 11 we are. I we want are. to just quickly, because this is where I think a lot of um, additional questions are going to come about. So as we know, the re-record is coming up. 2021 re-record is just around the corner. Um, right now, this first week in December, the um, Livestock Department is starting to mail out those re-record notices. So you may even start getting you may see an uptick, if you will, of brand questions because of that. Um, we certainly do. So the re-record year is from January 1st through December 31st, 2021. If a person does not re-record their brand by midnight, December 31st, 2021, that brand will become inactive. And once a brand is inactive, anyone else can record that as a new brand. And I, I can just see the questions coming in. And I want to cut you off because <laughs> I am not here to answer re-record questions. That is the livestock department. Um, they, you're, some of the questions I saw early on too about transferring all of those, transfer, re-record, new brands, fees, um, configuration questions, those are all livestock department questions. They've got a great FAQ page for the upcoming re-record. They've got great general information and they have contact information. We're, we're kind of familiar with some of this because we, we work with it a bit, but they're the ones to give you the authoritative answer and as librarians ask that's where we want to direct our patrons we're the ones to help with the histories you know my family had a brand in the 50s and i want to know more about it or i found this branding iron on my barn or this property i have um, sometimes we can even get lucky and find answers to that so those are the questions that come to us but these sort of re-record transfer block kind of questions just just refer to the um, department livestock so that's what we have for you today. I know it was a lot. And just confirm that we are here for you. So please reach out with any questions you have. We, we, I'm happy to stay. I'm sure Zoanne is an answer a few questions, but understand that folks have to go. I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording now. Thank you. First, thank our two presenters, um, Zoanne and Laura, for putting this all together and sharing it with all of you, and especially for bringing it online where we can sort of record it and have this information available, especially as we enter a re-record year. That's, and um, I just want to say that um, I learned a new word today, and, and that was <laughs> the brandification or whatever it was. <laughs> Brandabellical, yes, totally new word for me. So thank you so much, you two. We, are, we will stay on the line, though, um, if, you're, if you're attending live so we can get um, some more questions answered. So thank you so much. And I'm going to stop this recording. <laughs>